Good evening. My name is Matthew Ogden. I'd like to welcome everybody to a live webcast from LaRouchePack.com. Tonight is February 8th, 2013, and you're joining us for our weekly Friday night broadcast with Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, tonight, we will be following our format as we have before uh, with Mr. LaRouche's opening statements followed by discussion from inside the studio here. Joining us is Jason Ross and Dennis Mason tonight, um, and uh, they are both editors on LaRouchePack.com. So I'd like to give you Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Well, for this evening's occasion, there are three aspects of a, a three-part common question of the strategic situation which confronts the United States at this time. The first of these issues, of course, is Glass-Steagall. Not that Glass-Steagall is a new subject, but very few people understand what its implications are, and it's time that that be cleared up. Secondly, we have to deal with the fact that we have a war issue. The world is now on the edge of a general spread of thermonuclear warfare. And that's what, exactly what it is. There's nothing less than thermonuclear warfare of any significance as warfare right now. We already have enough warfare in, in local warfares, but this is a more general worldwide. Then thirdly, we have the question of two things which are the same thing. One is the SDI. The SDI policy still exists. It's a way of trying to, if you needed, to shoot down things that need to be shot down. Huh? It is also, in terms of uh, defense of Earth, but the other side of the defense of Earth is looking at systems which we call, call the SDE as opposed to the SDI. And these are pretty much the same thing in root design as the SDI, except the SDA deals with the defense of, of mankind and of, of the solar system, or parts of the solar system from now. So these three things combine what should be the strategy or the strategic policies of the United States now. They pertain implicitly to the questions of economy, but let's start with that. Now, people know about Glass-Steagall, or at least they should, if they have been awake in the past several years or longer. Glass-Steagall means that we cancel the ties of the United States. The affairs of the United States will no longer be subject to the private banking interests which have been behind the great hyperinflation drive now. We simply, it simply cancels it off. But the problem is this. Once we agree we're going to go with the, S, the uh, Glass-Steagall, we uh, can immediately begin to end the hyperinflation which is threatening to destroy the United States in particular, but also Europe and other parts of the world now. So this in integral part of this Glass-Steagall program means that we now have to find a way, and I know what the way is, is to uh, develop Glass-Steagall because what would happen is this with, with Glass-Steagall. Right now, the United States is dominated by a hyperinflationary swindle. And this has been going on ever since the cancellation of the Glass-Steagall program in the first place. Now, we now have a situation where most of the money outside, listed in banks and so forth, is worthless. It is already worthless. It's worthless by virtue of hyperinflation, which has now come to a certain limit. We have to shut it down. Now, most of those banks, which we have to sh shut off from Glass-Steagall, Glass-Steagall program, will go bankrupt. They will be ev evaporate. Most of their funds will disappear. Their incomes will disappear. But that's inevitable. It's either save the people or save swindlers. And I think the time has come. The swindlers had more than had their time. Now is the time for the people. Now, the problem here is this. If we take the total banking system, including the legitimate banking system, as compared with the illegitimate banking system, what has happened is the legitimate banking system has been cut off from the income which it should have enjoyed or which it should have participated. So therefore, if we, if we want to start a recovery of the United States economy, we have to take an additional measure. We have to introduce a new system, a credit system, which will be a function of the United States government, 
and the credit system will be used primarily to conduit funds through the, their system, through the Glass-Steagall system and the banking system for worthy investments supported by the U.S. government. So therefore you will have a, a banking system, a regular banking system, but this time supported by something was done immediately in the first uh, uh, session of the government of the United States. And at that point, the idea of a system was to give credit to the state, to the nation, to, in order to allow for and promote the increase of productive activities, agriculture, industry, and so forth, basic infrastructure, and so forth. Now, the only chance we have is that to get a real recovery. We could stop the bleeding now. We could stop the destruction now simply by implementing Glass-Steagall alone. But the, the amount of uh, secure funds and worthwhile funds available to continue the, cr the banking credit system to industry and, and government would be insufficient to recover, to build, actually build up the economy. So therefore, we need a supplementary program based on the same policy as the first administration of the United States. And that would mean that we would actually be providing federal funding, not federal money, but federal funding. That is, the federal government would be taking the responsibility for creating this fund. Now, the fund would not be paid out entirely as one loan, like an ordinary loan of that type, to the, to the persons who receive the, uh, become the debtor. But simply, they will get a, a progressive allowance of credit underwritten by the U.S. government when the, if the government finds that worthy of the confidence of the people and the nation. So that's, that's the way we have to function. We, we were going to have to also have a driver for a high-tech program. We can no longer continue to go backwards in terms of technology, which we've been doing now. If we go backwards in technology, we will die en masse, and that will happen very soon because of the present condition. Look, we have most of the labor force of the United States is not productive. Most people are, do, are occupied in employment in positions which are not at all productive. They are simply switching money around. It's like you have a, all the clerks you want in the front office, but there's no factory in, the, in behind. This is the kind of situation which we would, we would contend to face. So therefore, a credit system of the type conceived by Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary of the United States, the program of Hamilton's which saved the United States from the crushing effects of its foreign debt obligations at that time. And therefore, that becomes one of our, that's our issue. Now, at the same time, we have the question of the SDI, SDE, which I'll get into then. But then we go to another issue, the war issue. Presently, we are approaching, on a global scale, a general thermonuclear war. A general thermonuclear war. And the question is, you have great powers. China is a great power, a great thermonuclear power. Russia is a, therm is a great power, uh, a thermonuclear power. So therefore, you have the British Empire whose intention is to reduce the human population from currently 7 billion people to 1 billion people at a very rapid rate, is the chief instigator behind this war. Now you will observe that our Joint Chiefs of Staff have been fighting against the former, or the, the present administration now, it, I, because, to prevent such a war from being supported by the United States. Because if such a war were launched, you would have the threat of a general extinction, extinction of the U.S. and world population. Because to, what you're on the scale that to win a war, say a war on the one side between the British-controlled United States and on the other side China, India, and other countries, that war, the deployment of nuclear thermonuclear weapons, for that war, which is what we're looking at, 
would mean a virtual extinction of much of the human population on this planet. Therefore, sane people do not want what the United States, under the British direction, is doing now. And these are not British banks. The British banks are often sane, but the monarchy is not, at least in my, in my terms. So therefore, that's the problem. Now, we, we have to understand this, this thing I raised first, the Glass-Steagall concept. Glass-Steagall is what is needed. Glass-Steagall, simply as a piece of legislation, is what is needed. Yeah? But it cannot do the job by itself. It must take the opportunity created by Glass-Steagall and add to it another element of the federal government. And that element is the banking system, the credit system by which we will loan or take on responsibility for work which will be useful in terms of causing a growth in the population and increase in the productive powers of labor. Now the biggest component of this will be one component which is essentially necessary, absolutely indispensable to save our agricultural production and to save many other related things. And without that, without that project, which is the you know, NAWAPA project, which was designed in the middle of the 1960s. That project will be the, the lifesaver of the United States, of Canada in part, but also Mexico, northern Mexico. So therefore, that's a part of the program. It's a part of the, co of the combat to save the United States and other parts of the world. And without that program, first and foremost, you're not going to make it in this country. First and foremost, you must get Glass-Steagall through, first of all, among all economic-related policies. Glass-Steagall must be done immediately. It must be done first before any other financial legislation is installed. It must be done now, immediately. Because once that's done, then that act, combined with this, this provision I've indicated for a credit system, by the United States government itself. And that will save the United States. Now we remain, now the question of war, but more than just war. You have, for example, we had in World War, in the World War II period, or in, the, in that generation, we had what was called the SDI. I became, in the course of things, one of the leading founders of the SDI program as a political program from the last half of the uh, 1970s. And that grew internationally. I went into Europe for various other reasons as well. And from in Europe, among leading relevant German circles, French circles, the Gaullists in particular, Italian circles, other circles in other parts of the world, including India and so forth, we had a, a, an agreement among leading forces in these and related nations to establish a system of defense called the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that, that was then, in due course, under the uh, administration of a new president, was, it, was supported and continued to be supported throughout his entire two terms as president, Reagan. And that, that proposal would have saved the world from every step of, of problems that the, the world has suffered ever since. Because the in, the institu that institution of strategic uh, defense initiative would have created a, a world system implicitly which would have ensured the ability of the nations to get out of this war complex and to find what we might call the equivalent of peaceful and productive solutions to the crisis of all humanity. For example, we have whole parts of the world that are suffering from a lack of economic development, physical economic development. And these areas would, should be, for example, they should break up the euro system. It's breaking itself up anyway. We do not need a euro system. We must return the nations of Europe to their original sovereignties. Maybe they, whatever they want to do with those sovereignties is their business. But they must be supported in going back to that kind of a system of sovereign nation states. 
beginning in Europe and going further. You can do nothing for Europe today. Nothing, unless you get the equivalent of Glass-Steagall for Europe, all of Europe nations. And you must then break up the Euro system, which was a fraud from the beginning. So these are measures which all come together. They're all the same issue, really. It's like the component parts of the system of government. All the parts must function, but all the parts must function according to their distinctive characteristics. And that's what the policy must be today. So we must get off this babbling, babbling, babbling that goes on in government today. We must realize we have to make a fundamental shift, a, a fast kick to the present situation. You cannot do it piecemeal. You've got to take a combination of measures with agreements largely on a world scale. Because every nation in the world that's intelligent knows we cannot continue to go along with what we're doing now. We must stop it immediately, and we must take the appropriate totality of measures in the proper order of precedence. For example, before any financial reforms are made by the United States government, there must be Glass-Steagall first. Because the question is, if because if Glass-Steagall is on the agenda, and you're serious about it, you cannot allow any financial legislation coming in from the federal government. Because on the one hand, under the old system, pre-Glass-Steagall, you would have one policy. You would go with hyperinflation and blow the whole thing out immediately. If you go with Glass-Steagall first, with its three essential components, you know, the Glass-Steagall as such, a credit system, and then great projects such as NOAPA. Those three measures combined will assure a revival of the U.S. economy and reversal from this hell. But those measures, the threefold measures, must be supplemented by other measures, other reforms, including you have to have a reform of the international market. The euro system cannot survive the present situation. The entire euro system, is, is probably without England only, but the present euro system is going now into an immediate hyperinflationary explosion which would probably wipe out most of the nations of Western and Central Europe. So therefore, this must come first. But at the same time, the other requirements, we must change the military policy. We must not have wars. You may have many wars, which are already bad enough, but any general major war will go to thermonuclear warfare. And it will include great major powers Russia and China, which are major thermonuclear powers. And the United States called in to back up the British in starting World War Thermonuclear III. So these are the, these are the considerations which must be treated as not piece by piece, be, not separate measures. They must be one measure, one action initiated by the United States, encompassing all of these measures of action in one, one package. And if we do that, we can save the United States and probably can save the planet. If we don't do that and are unwilling to do this sim simple kind of one-stroke solution, you have to remember that you, the, the usual idea of reforms, of piecemeal reforms, has now just gone out the window. The idea that you should walk in on economic questions and related economic questions with this, a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this and a bit of the other, that kind of negotiating by the Congress must cease. We now need a coordinated reform in which all the essential parts, and I'm speaking only of the essential parts, all of the essential parts must be put into place in a specific order. Without that, this nation is finished. And I don't propose to have this nation of ours finished. Thank you. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're watching a live webcast with Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, we are now going to transition into the question period. I would just like to say 
that with the opening presentation you just made, it's very clear that uh, in order for this to function, as it did at the time of Ronald Reagan, you need to have an executive which takes the United States um, seriously as a as a institution, not who is the enemy of the United States and its constitution. And so therefore, in order to implement this this package, as you've just laid it out, it must be predicated on the impeachment or uh, otherwise legal removal of, of President Obama from the office of the presidency. And uh, what we've seen over the course of the recent weeks since the appellate court decision in the in the uh, DC District Court you've seen a uh, a a closing in a potential closing in around around Obama and I would just like to um, bring people's attention to a statement that was just posted on the website just less than an hour ago from Mr. LaRouche uh, which is called time for full full congressional probe of Obama's drone killing and Benghazi cover-up that's available on the website, and uh, this is going to be the subject which Jason will address in the first question here tonight. All right, this is kind of a big one here. This is a big subject. I um, I wanted to start by reading a, the beginning of a senator uh, a letter that Senator Wyden and ten other senators sent to President Obama on Monday. The letter begins, "Congratulations on your recent inauguration." We look forward to working with you in your second term. As the Senate considers a number of nominees for senior national security positions, we ask that you ensure Congress is provided with the secret legal opinions outlining your authority to authorize the killing of Americans in the course of counterterrorism operations. It's quite a cordial way to begin a letter, right? Now, um, <clears throat> the Senator points out that it's vitally important for the Congress and the American people to have a full understanding of how the executive sees the limits of its power. Now, later during the week, um, there was a, a leak of a, you know, via NBC of a Department of Justice white paper, which went through part of the justification of, you know, when is it, the title of the paper, this is lovely, is Lawfulness of a Lethal Operation Directed Against a U.S. Citizen Who is a Senior Operational Leader of Al-Qaeda or an Associated Force. I want to read a few quotes from this lovely paper. It says, um, first off, it says, yeah, it's, it's fine. You, you can kill American citizens if they're part of the leadership of al-Qaeda or an allied group. They wrote that, the DOJ wrote, certain aspects of this legal framework require additional explication. First, the condition that an operational leader present an imminent threat of violence against the U.S., does not require the U.S. to have clear evidence that a specific attack on U.S. persons and interests will take place in the immediate future. Which I, that's, I think, everyone's definition of what imminent would mean, but not the DOJ. They say that, by its nature, the threat posed by al-Qaeda and associated forces demands a broader concept of imminence in deciding when someone is a threat. Uh, we have to take into account considerations of how easy it is to act on them. Quote, with this understanding, a high-level official could conclude, for example, that an individual poses an imminent threat of violent attack against the U.S., where he is an operational leader of al-Qaeda or an associated force, and is personally and continually involved in planning terrorist attacks against the U.S. It goes on. Uh, maybe that's enough quotes from that. They also point out that murder, there's laws against murder, but it's not murder because they said that it's legal. And that on the point of surrender, they said that, yes, the U.S. would be required to accept a surrender if it were feasible to do so. Although, I mean, unless you see a drone pointing a missile at you, you have no ability to know that you're under suspicion and, you know, why you would ever surrender to anything. So, um... This was leaked. Uh, this was followed up by the administration releasing some of the records of their legal memos. Now, get this. These are memos that just give the concept that the, the government can kill American citizens. This isn't the internal workings of how those decisions are even made. This is just whether it's legal. And the administration has said that that has to be secret. Senator Wyden said that every American has the right to know when the government believes it's allowed to kill them. I think something we can all agree with. Senator Angus King 
brought up the Fifth Amendment and due process. He said that having the executive be the prosecutor, the judge, the jury, and the executioner all in one is very contrary to the traditions and laws of this country. So let me, let me just sort of, I suppose, get to the point here. I was going to talk some about the fact that, it, in addition to this, Obama, uh, in the discussion with um, Panetta and Dempsey in their testimony, they had to admit that President Obama was completely unconcerned with and paid no attention to the Benghazi attack while it was occurring, didn't ask for updates, didn't send in any forces to assist, nothing happened. So at the same time that there's this ability to kill American citizens if they're determined by a high-level official to be linked with al-Qaeda, when al-Qaeda actually is killing our ambassadors, Obama doesn't seem to care. So let me, um, let me, let me, let me pose the question to you here. Uh, sorry, one more thing. Senator Wyden's letter also quotes Obama in 2009. Obama said then that whenever we cannot release certain information to the public, for valid national security reasons, I will insist that there be oversight of my action by Congress or the courts. Um, the White Paper wrote that, quote, there exists no appropriate judicial forum to evaluate these constitutional considerations, however. So my question to you is, uh, it's about what, something that, um, that uh, Bruce Fine brought up at the, at the Schiller Institute EIR conference in New York. Uh, the past uh, a couple weekends ago, where he brought up the concept of due process being the breakthrough idea that the government recognizes as a judicial process that, hey, we could be wrong. So nowhere in this, in this uh, leaked legal memo from the Department of Justice, where it says if people are shown to be terrorists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, nothing comes up about how that determination would be made. There's no ability to challenge it. This is just a, 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 an ability to assassinate at will. So I'd like to ask what your thoughts are on the, some of this pushback from the Senate on this in light of the, the uh, judicial ruling that Matt had just mentioned. Oh, good. Well, coincidentally, this week there was a significant amount of flurry in the British press about Richard III. <laughs> And uh, Richard III was uh, found to be, had a crooked back in the lower parts and so forth, all reported, and therefore it's decided that this corpse, un which is buried underneath some field, uh, probably intentionally that way, uh, was Richard III. Now, the famous case of Richard III, which Shakespeare reports, is the drowning of a member of the court in a butt of Malmsey. Now, there you have an exact example of what Obama is talking about. Take anyone you don't like and drown them in a butt of Momsy. And lacking that, you can probably find some other flying device to do the job for you. So we really are, and remember Richard III left his office dead and much hated. And I think that's the only thing to do. I think just take it. Let's take British history as a precedent for this case. Um, and therefore, the, what Richard III did to a, a member of his court in a butt of Malmsey is, I think, the appropriate symbol to remind the British in particular, the British population in particular, since they just uncovered this corpse again, um, to uh, consider, and I think that other nations of Europe and also the United States might consider the same thing. Now, this is this is a fraud. This is evil. This is the worst kind of murderous injustice you can conceive of. This man should be th not ustered out of office, but thrown out of office, and then criminal charges might be considered beyond that point because what he's done, what he's caused to be done. Is a crime of the type of the Hitler regime. And I think we need another hearing on such matters to remind people that it wasn't enough to reduce one member of the Hitler's tribe. Maybe we've got another one to get rid of. Okay, I have a... Uh... A 
question. You, you went through two aspects of the crisis, the, the war danger and the financial you went through in terms of policy. Um, the question I have is more to how uh, to look at these as one and the same crisis. Uh, over the course of the week, last weekend at the Verkunda Siri, uh, Security Conference, um, there they tried to put the blame on the continuing conflict in Syria uh, on the table uh, at the doorstep of Russia. Um, over the course of the thing, uh, UN Envoy Brahimi, he um, went to Foreign Minister Lavrov um, to have a meeting about uh, saying, let's get Assad out of there. That meeting with him lasted about uh, 10 minutes. And then after that, Lavrov went and spoke with um, a representative from the Syrian opposition for a half hour, um, who then went to uh, the Iranian foreign minister and met with him for 45 minutes on this question of actually resolving the situation. Now, also during the Verkunda uh, conference, you had the head of NATO, Rasmussen, uh, say that NATO now has a global mission. Uh, he said, wherever and whenever the Allies judge their security interests are at stake, um, that, 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 that they have the, their mission to, to defend that. Um, he said, when I look out at our world, I see an arc of crises stretching from the Sahel to Central Asia. We must stand ready to deter and defend against any threat. Um, now, right after this conference, you had Tony Blair give an interview um, where he referenced uh, what's happening in the Middle East as a generations-long war against radical Islam. Now, fast-forwarding to just a recent few days, um, keeping an eye on Russia, looking on their eastern border, um, you had the other day, uh, the Chinese, it was reported that the Chinese military uh, locked onto a... or. Uh, locked onto a Japanese warplane uh, with a radar lock, which is a, a, a certain posture of threat. And then uh, just today, I think it was, or yesterday, you had Japan um, send up two fighter jets uh, to intercept what was uh, believed to be the invasion of Japanese uh, airspace by the Russians. So you have this... And every day, day by day, in the Middle East, there's bombings, there's killings. The thing is just a simmering... Uh, 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 like a pressure cooker, and uh, the heat is just consistently being turned up. Um, now, at the same time, you also have many things, which I won't go through here, happening on the financial front. Uh, the latest was that there was an all-night session of Parliament in Ireland where they uh, liquidated Anglo-Irish Bank, and um, basically, uh, well, in the words of uh, Sinn Sh Sin Féin uh, finance, uh, financial spokesman Pierce Doherty, he said the government has traded the 28 billion euro promissory note debt for a sovereign liability to the state of up to 60 billion euro. So take the bailout and put it on the back of the people. Um, and we've seen how that's played out in, in, um, in Europe. So what I'd like to get from you is how to look at what's happening in the financial system and what's happening in the strategic situation as indeed one generative, the, the one generative principle behind these things. Okay. Well, first of all, there's no difference between warfare and similar things and economics in this matter, and finance. No difference whatsoever. Uh, the thing to look at is you've got to look at things. History is very useful if you know history and if you know in particular some of the deep background which was uncovered in, the, say, a post-war history where these investigations went on, like these trials, and Nuremberg trials. And you go back and say, how did World War II actually begin as World War II? Well, there was a Hitler and company. Hitler had a, a great address on the subject of Edouard Benesch, the relevant honcho of Czechoslovakia. And he, what he did, he took the case of having blasted Benesch, con condemning up and down and doing various other nasty things to Czechoslovakia at that time, to start a war which became World War II, II with Poland by accusing the Poles of setting something evil up, which led to the beginning of World War II in a formal sense. When you look at these issues that you're talking about, this type, you've got to put them in a single category. You have a war power, which is represented by the British Empire, 
Now, the British Empire is not just the British Empire. It's not just British. The English people, or the Scottish people, and the Welsh people, and so forth, are one thing. They have a certain right to exist as nation states, separately or combined. That's their right. But the problem is, is that when a pretext is used under such covers of some other apparently innocent titles as that, then you are dealing with a deliberate war crime. And then the war crime, where's the, what's the war crime? What's the real issue here? Why is all this being done? Don't look at each, each fact. Don't look at each footprint. Maybe you'll find some mixed footprints there. Look for some other things. Look for a more general, look for, look for the, how the world is reacting. People like to react to individual ex experiences. I don't. I know individual experiences are, when they're dealt with, are usually with, dealt with with utter incompetence and utter dis disregard for all significant factors. When a general war is starting, take for case the ca case, particular case of the ouster of Bismarck in 1890. Until that point in 1890, Bismarck, as the Chancellor of Germany, had worked with the Tsarist government of Russia in order to prevent, in cooperation, an agreement with the Tsar not to be involved in a war launched by, under British instructions, by the Archduke or, of Austria to get a Balkan war going. So what the British Empire did because the British Empire wanted a general world war. They wanted it. And Bismarck was the obstacle, because if Bismarck had remained Chancellor, they couldn't have had World War I. It depended upon getting Bismarck out of power. So then, how are you going to understand an event that occurs under such circumstances? You can't say, this guy did it. This guy didn't do much of anything. He simply was mani manipulated into playing a role from higher international power. What should have been done? Now, just take the case of the uh, war uh, of uh, Germany uh, with, with Britain. When did that happen? Well, it didn't really happen right away. It was a fake war, in a sense. It was, it was a staged war. The British and the French government both wanted Germany to succeed in destroying certain other countries. And if you look at the history of what, you take the whole history of de Gaulle's uh, reports, which are, deal with the, all the facts of this thing quite clearly, the, the government of France was led by a traitor to France, who had been a former war leader in World War I. What happened is de Gaulle, in, the, in this process, had commanded a unit which he or, organized, uh, again, for defense operations, but he was all outnumbered totally by the, by the French traitors. Um, and there were a lot of French traitors who were, actually had an idea that they were going to get, that Hitler was not going to be too successful in launching this war. And therefore, they were going to manage something, a trap, to make Hitler successful in some things, but to create a certain new kind of dictatorship led by Britain based on an alliance between Britain and the tra traitors of France, who ran the French government at that time. And if you look at the history of how the war rep defense rep uh, representations were made, in that case, the case is clear. The same thing is true with, with this other case, the case of Bismarck. They wanted a war, they got a war. And the damn fools believed it was all an honest war. So the Chamberlain was, Chamberlain's game fa failed. Why? Because Hitler had underestimated, and the British had underestimated foolishly, what the capabilities of the Wehrmacht was. The Wehrmacht was not a Hitler organization. It was a German force. And the German force was a strategic force of great reckoning. And the, the French on whom the British were allied were a bunch of fascists ready to agree with Hitler 
on fascism. They had no impl implication of where they were going with this. They didn't care. They wanted a fascist system. The British wanted a fascist system. They wanted to establish a world fascist system. So then the British found themselves not in a good shape. And so they changed the leadership of the British United Kingdom, the British Empire, brought Churchill in. Churchill screamed to the United States, to the President of the United States, for succor. We gave the British cover of a lot of uh, equipment, including destroyers, other ship equipment. And the war began to evolve. In this process, de Gaulle had an agreement with Churchill, as did Franklin Roosevelt. And so forth, they began to organize against this monstrosity which had been set into motion by the British Empire, because it was the British Empire which st set up the whole operation to begin with. They were going to orchestrate something. And if you look at the history of general warfare, in the history of, uh, say, since the 19, well, back, back since, in, say, modern times, it, this, this has always been the policy, this kind of policy. And the, the Peace of Westphalia was supposed to top it, stop it. Now you have the uh, Peace of Westphalia has been outlawed virtually hmm, by Tony Blair and outlawed in practice by the British monarchy. What's the British monarchy's policy? We now have 7 billion people living on this planet, according to the last report. The British intention, which is made very clear, is that there should not be more than about one billion people inhabiting the entire planet. That's what the green policy is. So the green policy is essentially a new fascist policy. And you've got dreamy-eyed idiots calling themselves scientists who are spreading this green folly all over the place. They're cutting food into fuel. How foolish can you be? Here we are, we are, we're starving in the United States, and we're going to starve to death over the coming winter at the present rate because the food supply is collapsing because of the policies of the Obama administration in particular, and also Monsanto, a little fascist operation all itself. So when we look at these things, we cannot try to pick out isolated incidents and try to list the number of incidents that are, as if in a catalog, like a Sears Roebuck catalog, huh? and pick your policies on that basis. What you have to do is you have to understand a process. Unfortunately, most people today, are, in the United States in particular, are very, very poorly educated. First of all, they are not trained for skilled employment. Skilled employment has been shipped out of the United States into other locations. But that was done with shipping Detroit out of the United States and throwing it into China and other places. Most people who are employed are not employed in productive work. Very few people are engaged in productive work, except kitchen work, and it's awful slave work, in terms of remunerations and conditions of life. So the problems, we, when we get to these kinds of problems, we have to get sensible and realize that there are forces in this planet which have been there for a long time, say since the siege of Troy is one good example of how long this thing has gone on. And you look at the number of layers in the, in the site of Troy, and you get some idea of how old Troy was by the number of layers that were represented on that same particular site which was an earthquake-prone site. So therefore, they had a whole succession of earthquakes, and, and they, what would they do? They'd level the land off and put something on top of it. And that, was a, that is, to the present day, still a study of, the, of Troy. But the point was that this kind of warfare, this kind of primitive, destructive warfare, is not innate in the human being. It's not innate in, the, in human cultures. It was a, a kind of degeneration which came upon us in some time in ancient. It was the oligarchical conception, the oligarchical system. And the oligarchical system in its modernist form is still the problem. The idea of Wall Street 
is the same thing. Wall Street is the enemy of the people of the United States and of many other nations as well. And when we, when we deal with these things and try to make a judgment on horrifying events, we have to look at the actual process by which that, that event, that problem came upon us. Don't try to pick on some sp scapegoat and then go on and do the same thing all over again, having sacrificed a scapegoat. What you have to do is recognize that there's forms of government and of systems in government. Now, take one more fact in this matter. A long time ago, not that long ago, there was a man called Nicholas Acuza. And Nicholas Acuza, in the course of his great genius, which gave us modern science, as a matter of fact, Acuza was the author of modern science with some other people also associated with him and similar people in that time. So Kuza, uh, in the process before he died, people died early in those days, and we probably will again soon, the way things are going now. He, his think, concern was, and it was a conclusion he reached, the conclusion was that you could not ex assume that Europe, with its culture, was capable of providing guidance for a decent condition of humanity. His argument was that the people in Europe who wanted to save Europe from its destruction, its self-destruction, must send people across the oceans, the great oceans, to develop new, new systems of government across the water. Now, Kuza died in this process of this campaign, but his information and his friends lived on. And in walks a gentleman called Christopher Columbus one day in, into Lisbon, in Portugal. And there he was made acquaintance with what Cusa had said. On the basis of that, a whole group of people in Spain and elsewhere, the Portugal navigators of the type of the Atlantic, had moved, begun to move to the idea of going across the Atlantic to the shores on the other side, which they knew. It was already known. The idea that it was ignorance had t taken this away from people, but this was already known before that. The, ge the geometry of the plant was known. The uh, backwardness had stepped in, and it was forgotten. But so Christopher Columbus arrived on time at his crossing of the Atlantic with three ships. What this did, it caused a convulsion within Europe because of this. What happened was that the fact that when the ocean was crossed in this way, and Christopher Columbus was not, in, in that effect, successful in his particular colonization, but the program continued. And the first really successful case, there had been good cases before in Colombia and so forth, but their Jed Butchery had killed off the leading good people in that place, and people who were more stupid, more malleable were pl in place. So the, it was in the, this, what we call the state of Massachusetts today that the first successful effect of Cusa's message to implicitly Columbus started. But then the Anglo-Dutch party, which was really the new Venetian party, came along and destroyed the power of Massachusetts. But what had been done during more than a century since the first settlement in 1620 in Massachusetts, what it had done is something by Dutch, particularly Dutch and English and also uh, others, French colonists, had created a situation inside Northern America, the Northern shore, Atlantic shore, which inspired the idea of the spread of the new ideas of Cusa, not to immediate success inside Europe itself, but to success of those who fled a corrupt Europe and moved into the United States. And that's been the character of the United States, even with everything that happened to us uh, up until the end of the 18th, 19th century. That we, we had remained, we brought immigrants in. We brought them in from all parts of the Europe and, and elsewhere. We brought them in from 
the, the, the Danish area, from the Swedish area, uh, from all kinds of places. And they came. And what they did is they would come with the first generation, and they were not so, so lucky. But they, they've struggled. They had children. They struggled to make their children more effective, to develop them. And you had within three generations and more, you had a new spirit inside North America in particular, which spread across the Atlantic. The pressure of the America, which the British found out in the 17th century, and the pressure was such that they had to adapt to the implicit power of what this colonization had meant. And that is still the real issue behind all this today. We have a system which is the evil system, called the oligarchical system. There have been efforts in Europe to free itself from this thing. There have been bloody efforts to f prevent that from, being ha from happening. The problem is we need to get to what we're, the objective today has to be, not to how do we answer this problem or that problem or that problem. The question today is, can we come to a decision among people as among nations to organize their relationships on the appropriate basis of the sovereignty of each respectively. Can we create that kind of a world? Because if we can't, in the age of thermonuclear weapons, humanity could not survive. So we have to look at these issues not as isolated things that you can make gossip about, but you have to understand that the problem of humanity on this planet is an old planetary problem. And the efforts have been made by some to try to overcome that oligarchical principle which caused the evil which has happened to this planet. And we have to do it now in a time of thermonuclear weapons where we make that change stick once and for all. Good, thank you. Um, we had a question come in uh, from a pro Glass Steagall uh, hedge fund uh, person in the city of London um, on this question of Glass Steagall and on um, what has been said uh, out of the Chancellor of Exchequer, uh, Exchequer in, in uh, Britain, um, Osborne. Um, to kind of situate a little bit on this fight uh, for Glass Steagall here in the United States. Uh, this week, we did have uh, four new signers on to uh, Marcy Captor's bill, which is in the House. Um, the Oregon State, uh, the Oregon State Democratic Party, their, their legislative agenda has Glass Steagall as the second point. Um, and the Pennsylvania State House, uh, a senior Democrat, along with a Republican co-sponsor, has um, put a, a resolution in uh, for consideration in the House in, in Pennsylvania. So this fight is is still uh, getting momentum. I'll read the question from um, from our, 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 our person here. Uh, he asks, the choice to become the new head of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, is known to me as a total stinker. He is anti-Glass-Steagall, pro-Bernanke, and pro-quantitative easing, and comes from Goldman Sachs, where he was contracted to help the Russian government reorganize following the Yeltsin 1998 debt crisis. While he developed a plan for Russia on behalf of Goldman, Goldman was shorting Russia, betting against their ability to cover their debts. There has been a lot of talk in London around the issue of Glass-Steagall, the talk of Vickers, ring fencing, electrified ring fencing, etc. I think is designed to change the subject. Despite all this verbiage, including Chancellor Osborne's grandstanding against too big to fail this week, it appears the boys are betting that Carney, along with his fellow Go Goldman alums, Draghi and Monty, can hold off significant change. I believe the big talk from Osborne is a cover for their fears that something big is about to happen with European banks. Do you think they can hold back the tide much longer before everything blows out, as the unpayable debt is even bigger than you say? And given your open and forthright stand for Glass-Steagall, while we on this side of the pond face continuing dishonesty, is there anything we can do here to help you win the fight there? Yes, there is. And you don't need bullets to do it. It's very simple. 
if you commit in the United States the necessary reform of Glass-Steagall, and if you do it first before Obama and company do so get something in there first to screw this up, but if, as of today, if the Congress of the United States votes up Glass-Steagall and includes in that what I stipulated here today, the supplementary thing of a credit system working as an official agency of the United States to steer credit for credible purposes in order to get our people back to work. And I've typified the glass, the, uh, what we, the WAPA, as the one thing which it addresses the, the crucial problem threatening the entire United States in the western territory west of the Mississippi River. It means you've got to open up the Missouri, get the Mississippi functioning, but uh, immediately, but at the same time, which is a change from the present policy. If we do that, and then you, in, you include this measure and you apply it to Glass-Steagall, Glass the, the NWAPA measure, the NWAPA measure will, be, will increase the water supply available in the United States, say over a 20-year period of the development of this system, will increase the water supply of the United States by a ratio of up to as much as 1.7 factor. Because you're going to regenerate, see, every when you circulate water, it doesn't go away, it doesn't get used up. Water doesn't get used up, that's not the way you consume it. Water is recirculated, and the greater the number of times you can recirculate the water, the more water you have, the more water per year. Not because you have more water in total quantity, but you're recycling the same water more often. And that has the effect of actually solving the problem. That is the only way right now that we can solve the, the hunger problem for the future years of the United States. So therefore, the, the, me the measures have to be taken in that way. And understand that all the stuff we hear will not work. It's, it's proven to be a failure. Ever since the assassination of the two Kennedy brothers, the United States has been going to hell at an accelerating rate. It started with the, with the war, the Vietnam War, which never should have happened. Why was he killed? Well, mostly because he was opposed to starting the war. That's why the president was murdered by U.S. forces with foreign accomplices. And they tried to cover it up quick. So we're shutting this thing down. This guy did it. It's all settled. No more discussion. Mm -hmm. And that led us into a long war, which took the better part of a decade in total terms of that, just that one Indochina war, because you went all through to Cambodia and so forth. It was a continuing war. And what did it do to the people of the United States? The generation of the citizens of the United States, particularly the young citizens of the United States, the coming citizens of the United States, were degenerated within two years to three years. The drug addict program took over. Every kind of indecency and degeneration you can imagine flourished. And even though we struggled against that, there was resistance against it. There was just an important resistance by President Reagan himself and other people. Clinton, President Clinton was a resistor of, against this thing not quite as energetically as I would like to have had him be. But nonetheless, this was the point. And what is it? Well, if you go back to the time of back in the early part of the 18th, 19th century, you had a, an agent of the British who controlled President Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson was more of a turd than a person. He's a grouchy, stinking old character, and he was run by a bunch of people who were working for the British imperial banks. The system of the, uh, of the United States uh, was controlled through Britain from the New York, Boston area. And the famous banks or historic banks in New York and in Boston were the primary criminals who created this. This Jackson admin administration gave us what? It gave us slavery. 
Slavery already existed among some people like Jefferson. Jefferson was not such a good guy. No slave owner can be a good guy. Huh? And it went on. And the New York bankers took over the United States, but they were really British bankers. The entire Manhattan crowd were all British bankers, the British Empire, or the Boston, Boston uh, types. And so then we had a civil war. And the genius of Lincoln and his advisors saved the United States. But then the British came back with the same old crap all over again. The British Empire. We had a good, good president. But then they assassinated him and brought in a British fool. Huh? Then we had, a, so we had, for example, Woodrow Wilson, a president, another British stooge, was a, was a member of the society that organized the slave trade in the United States, the system of slavery. And the biggest, the biggest business of the slave trade, slavery, in the United States was organized by Wilson himself, the President of the United States, while he was President, under the same banking interests. And we didn't get a real President, a real honest President, until Franklin Roosevelt. And when Franklin Roosevelt died, we lost that great President and got a bum instead. Then we got a former General, we still General Matt McQuarters, and, and he could do some things but not as much as he wished he could do. And then you had also, then you had our president, uh, our little Irishman, uh, and his brother. And they pushed something which was actually a spur of progress, which could have saved the United States. <coughs> but they killed him. It was killed by, with the consent and agreement of people in the United States who were in leading positions, including in government, including the Dulles crowd. And look what happened after that, that decade. What happened the next decade? What's happened since? What's happened to the world since? The world, the transatlantic region, has been in a steady flow, accelerating though, over the entire period since the assassination of Jack Kennedy. And that's what you have to think about. All right, well, let me, this will be the last question tonight on economics. Um, you know, people think about the future. People think about what the future will bring them. Children think what they're going to be when they grow up. People imagine how will generations in the future live. But the very idea of future seems to have changed dramatically in the past few decades. You know, there was a time where the future and the present were understood in terms of what created them, what brought them about, what continued to create them like uh, you know, the body of a living organism, which is continually recreated. But today, the idea of a future seems to me to be a continuation of present conditions. People imagine how things are, and if they can't see how things would change that into the future, they just sort of figure it will keep going, if you're not thinking in terms of it always being made. But are we creating what's needed for the future? Of course we're not. You know, the state of our infrastructure, such as the recent jam-up and barge shipping, the, the water crisis, the food crisis, uh, which you just addressed, would be, would be uh, taken up by NAWAPA. You know, the regulations we've got on things like nuclear materials and things like this that prevent their use. You know, it all paints the picture of a nation that's not able at all to recreate what's needed for the continuing generations uh, to live. And the physical state of our nation, that's a very real and imminent threat uh, to our survival, one that can't be shot with a drone to fix it. So we really need what would have to seem like an emergency mobilization on the economy before we run against a physical barrier making it almost impossible and yet we still don't have Glass-Steagall. So in terms of human economy being a continuous recreation, what do you believe that, what would you say are some of the, uh, the ideas that people are missing or the most important misconceptions that prevent them from understanding what a human economy is. Well, the problem is we have a population that is not really educated. They're educated in terms of numbers, but they're not really educated. When you take away from a people the challenge of science, 
Uh, do you have to say science in the ge generic term? That everything where you create something new, which is better than something that existed beforehand, and where you are uplifting the standard of living and the progress of mankind, when, when people can say of themselves that what they're doing is making the world better and they're damn proud of it, that, in, in the simplest terms of expression, that's what progress is. The desire to be able to discover something they can do which will make the world better for mankind. Now it comes to a new, new area where we now have a new crisis. And crises are to be welcomed, not because they occur, but because they challenge us to get up off our butt and do something that needs to be done. We're now threatened, as you know, as early, I think our people here know all this, we are now within a short period of time when we have one of the closest encounters, or near encounters, with both the moon and earth at the same time. Now this thing, if it were to just be a little bit different than we think it is in terms of course, could hit either the moon or the earth itself, the planet earth itself would be a very ex destructive experience. Yeah. And then there are other problems which bear on the same point. So therefore we are challenged to be good. We get spanked by the universe if we don't do smart things. Mm -hmm. We now have a po point where it's urgent that mankind go to Mars, not to live there, but to send equipment up there which is functioning, which like Curiosity will sit there on Mars and will do certain things, work that's essential for the interest of mankind, without putting anybody's foot on Mars. And if they're smart, they'll go further. They'll build more sophisticated equipment and they'll put it on Mars. Send it from Earth. Bring it down like Curiosity on Mars in a selected location. And they'll begin to do something else. Instead of just the ordinary <coughs> broadcasting back from Mars, they will do something a little more adventurous. And they will start to solve problems on Mars whose results they will project to other locations. We have all these objects up there called asteroids, for example. We don't have any control now, even knowledge of the majority of those asteroids. Any number of them could at some time later or sooner strike Earth. Now our, our basic approach today so far is to say, can we put something out there to intercept the asteroid and to prevent it from hitting Earth? Because a very a large asteroid, event, not that big really, but a large asteroid hitting Earth with some great force could lead to the virtual extermination of the human species. So this is a mission we have to, we have to deal with. So it's not merely that we sit with the opportunity, if we choose, to solve for problems of science, particularly scientific problems, but we are impelled to move fast to develop the technologies which will be deliverable in time to save life on Earth, to save even the existence of life on Earth. And that's, we're, we're in that kind of field, so therefore the green problem must end because the green, the green policy means the extinction of the species. What's out there, if we don't interfere, is enough to exterminate the human species. And all we have to do is really just divert some of this crap so it doesn't hit Earth, or maybe some things will get through and we'll deal with it. But we're, going to be, we're not going to be sitting here waiting to get hit. We're going to go out there and do something. And we're going to use Mars as one of the points of reference, which is necessary to reference, in order to get a better handle on what this whole problem is. It appears that the problem is becoming greater for, your, for Earth. That's only an appearance because we don't have enough information on what's going on out there. But the very fact that these kinds of challenges necessity requires us to solve a problem. And that necessity makes the heroes of the, of the future day. 
the need to solve the problem and the effort to solve it and the solving of it makes the hero of today. And that's the way we as human beings manage to do our job. Thank you very much, Lynn, for a very excellent webcast. Um, that brings a conclusion to our broadcast for tonight. I know a lot of people who are watching have been activated in the recent period to do a lot to move the policy of this country and to work with our organization in what we are attempting to accomplish. And I thank you for that, and I encourage you to continue doing as much as you have been doing and much, much more. So uh, I think that these broadcasts are essential in the continuing effect of what we've accomplished in the recent period and into the extended future. So I'd like to thank Mr. LaRouche again. I'd also like to thank Jason and Dennis for participating tonight. And thank you for watching. That brings a conclusion to our broadcast tonight. Stay tuned to LaRouche Pack TV.